Well, here they were in their boat doing what they did best. They were fishermen by trade. It was an honest living that James and John had. They had done it their entire lives. And this particular day was not so much unlike every other day for them. It started before the crack of dawn. They got up early and got everything ready and they pushed off from shore and spent hours and hours fishing out at sea. And after they had felt they had spent enough time and caught enough fish, it was time to return. And the first place they went was to the market and they dropped off their catch of the day. And then they went back and docked their boats, and and they still weren't ready to go home. They still had some business to take care of, and this is the way they pretty much ended every day, and that was by mending their nets. For fishermen that rely on nets, strong nets, for catching fish, it was important that the wear and the tear and the breakage that would take place or the snagging on to items out in the Sea of Galilee that uh, weren't intended like logs and stuff like this meant that they needed every day to double check their nets and every place where they saw a tear, they saw an extra wide opening, they had to spend some time fixing their nets. And so that's what they were doing. They had done this so many times before that they could pretty much do it with their eyes shut now. The operation that they were a part of wasn't just any operation. It was their dad's. It was Zebedee's. And it wasn't just a family business either because it was a big enough operation that they had hired men that worked for them. And so the likelihood is that there wasn't just one boat, but there were multiple boats, maybe even a fleet of boats that they had for fishing. One day this would all be theirs. Probably in much the same way that Zebedee's dad, James and John's grandfather, had passed it on to their dad, so he, Zebedee, would one day pass it on to them. It was a respectable way to earn a living. But what was different on this day was that man that was standing on the shore. That man spoke up and called out to them and said, Come, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. James and John had heard of this fellow before. The prophet, the one with the odd clothes and the extra long hair that was in the wilderness preaching a message of repentance, he had been telling for some time now that the the Messiah, the anointed one, was coming. And so as soon as they heard Jesus call to them, without hesitation, the next thing that they knew, they were dropping their nets and they were climbing out of the boats. Now you stop and think about that for a moment and what that represented, what they were leaving. They had careers. They pretty much had their whole lives mapped out before them. They had secure futures. They seemingly had every reason to stay put and to continue doing what it is they had been doing. But they willingly set all of that to the side for the opportunity of following the one who was calling them. In becoming a part of what Jesus represented, they were willing to give up everything. And it's not like they were the only ones. Earlier, Peter and his brother Andrew had done the same thing. Later, Matthew, a different occupation, but he would do the same thing. And several others besides. They could have played it safe and they could have clung to the life that they knew, but instead, by following Jesus, they were stepping into the unknown. They were taking a risk. But here's the thing on this. Jesus still calls for people to do the same thing today. 
Yeah, the story as it's recorded in Mark 1, the story is regarding something that took place some 2,000 years ago. But the whole point is, it's not isolated or limited to that time frame. Jesus still calls for people to do the same, to come and be followers of His. Let me share with you what I consider to be one of the more unpopular verses in the Bible. I think the word unpopular is a good word to use on this. It's unpopular, at least in the sense that the first time people normally see it, it's not one that you readily embrace. It's one that maybe, if anything, makes you swallow hard. Maybe the word unpopular isn't the best word, so let's give it a different word. This represents one of the more intimidating verses in the Bible. Maybe that would be a better word, so you could cross out unpopular if you want and put intimidating. But then again, intimidating may not be the best word either. So maybe there's another word, the word threatening. Yeah, we keep doing this and you'll run out of space on your outline crossing everything out. Actually, all three of the words do fit as far as this verse. This particular verse is somewhat of an unpopular verse because it is intimidating, and it's intimidating because it's threatening in what it says. The words of Jesus as recorded in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, says this, If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Just let that sink in for a moment, especially if you're not as familiar with this verse of Scripture. So look at it again and reread it again. Jesus said, If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Yeah, that verse, that's, that's not the only place that you'll find that particular teaching in the Gospels, is Matthew chapter 10. In fact, you look around for it and you'll find it four, five, six, seven times in the Gospels. Multiple places, and as is normally the case, when you find something that repeatedly is being taught, there is some emphasis that is attached to it. That verse, though it was spoken at a later time, perfectly represents what James and John did. They gave up their lives. And in so doing, they ultimately found their life. I remember back in 1978 when I had made a decision for Christ that at that time I had different individuals that were basically telling me when, when they would ask what's going on, why are, you, why are you doing some of this that you're doing? And, and uh, um, you know, like one of the things, I mean, right after I made a decision for Christ, within two weeks, I knew, I just knew I was going to be going into ministry as a preacher, a missionary, or something. I just, it, it somehow was so impressed upon me that it wasn't even a, a negotiable thing. It was just, this is what I'm going to do. And as I would share that kind of stuff with people as far as the decision for Jesus I'd made and what was happening in my life, without fail, I had a number of people telling me basically the same thing they were saying after, and you could tell, they didn't really get it. They didn't really understand what or why, you know, I was doing what I was, what I was talking about. But, but uh, the consistent message I was getting back is like, oh, okay, well, don't get carried away. You know, that phrase, don't get carried away with it. I had family members that were telling me, even though they didn't agree with it and they, they didn't like what was happening, but... But finally, when they realized that, well, he's stubborn enough, he's probably going to stick with it. And, and so, but then they would give me the phrase, don't get carried away. I had classmates telling me that, who I had, I had been with these classmates. I'd gone to that same school all the way from first grade. And, and so some of these guys uh, and girls I had known for years. And, and, and I had some classmates telling me, yeah, but don't get carried away. Uh, that summer, I was working at John Deere, and I had a fellow employee with me there when I was trying to explain the changes, you know, that were taking place in my life, you know, he too said the same thing, don't get carried away. Two months later, after I had made the decision in the middle of July, two months later, while uh, the first semester of my senior year in high school, the counselor made it a part of his routine 
every year first semester is to meet one-on-one -on -one with every senior and to talk to them about their future. And so for the first time, I met with this particular counselor and sat down, and he asked me a bunch of questions and about college and things for, regarding the future and all. And I was answering them honestly from where I was at, just two weeks or two months removed from uh, my conversion experience. And, and, uh, and he too said, okay, I understand, you know, that's fine, that's fine, but don't get carried away is what the school counselor had told me as well. So that's what I was hearing in one ear, while at the same time, simultaneously, I was hearing that from Scripture in the other ear. And of course, I mean, who are you going to ultimately listen to here when it comes to who your counselor is? It's going to be the Word of God. You say, well, perhaps, perhaps we're looking at this and we're reading it a little too strongly or we're reading it in the wrong way. Maybe our interpretation is a little bit off uh, and we're putting too much into it. Well, you know, one of the most basic rules of hermeneutics is to allow, anytime you come to a, a complicated passage of Scripture, one that's difficult to really break it down, is to allow the Bible to shed light on the Bible. Allow the Bible to open your eyes to the Bible. And so on this, just you know, in case we're putting too much into this particular verse, let's look at other passages that talk about something somewhat similar. Let's go to Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, a complete different writer than Matthew. This is uh, the Dr. Luke, and here's what he says in verses 23 and 24. He says, Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. Well, verse 24 is just pretty much verbatim the same thing that Matthew was recording in chapter 10 of his gospel account. Verse 23, you know, we don't have a problem with the way that it begins, and the way that it ends, I mean, the way that it begins, Jesus is saying, if anyone wants to come with me, and then the way it ends is, follow me. We don't have any problem with that, but it's the stuff in between that kind of, kind of sounds extreme. The idea that he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. You know, that seems to be somewhat of the extreme part of that verse. Back in that day, people associated the cross with one thing and only one thing. When they thought or viewed a cross, it was death. That's what came to mind. The cross was an instrument of death. Nobody had the cross as jewelry. Nobody had the cr a cross, a symbol of a cross, on a wall in their living room or office or anything like that. Nobody did that. Whenever anyone thought of the cross, it was disgusting. It was cruel. It was ugly. It was blood-stained. It represented death. Now, of course, things have changed after the resurrection of Christ, and now the cross ends up being a symbol of victory and because of what Jesus accomplished and all. But you've got to remember, during his teaching here, this is before Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised back to life again. And so when he's saying these words, there's only one way that people are, are hearing it. You know, it's like, take up your cross. But here's the thing, though. I don't think Jesus was meaning literally death, though most of the disciples ended up dying as martyrs eventually. I don't think that that's exactly what Jesus is making reference to here because he uses the qualifying word daily. And if he's talking about death, well, it's only one day you need to take up your cross. You die, and then you're dead, and there's not a tomorrow. But he's talking about an, an, another dimension of it. And it falls right after the phrase where he says, he must, a person that wants to come with me, must deny himself, take up his cross. So the idea, the combination here, is that we are to deny ourselves, we are to die to ourselves. Daily. That means we do that today, we do that tomorrow, we do that the next day, and on it goes. Daily. If we're going to be a true follower, a disciple of Jesus, this is what Jesus says needs to happen. 
You see, the idea here is that every day anew, you give yourself totally, you give yourself unreservedly, 100% to Him. Your plans, your dreams, your agenda, your goals, your personal preferences, you've surrendered all of that over to Him. You deny yourself. You do not reserve the right in any particular category, you know, as far as future dreams or plans or or personal preferences and how you want to spend your time or spend your money. You don't reserve the right in any area. You die to self. You deny yourself. And you give yourself entirely over to Him. Let me show you another passage that that helps shed even more light on this. Luke talks about it a few chapters later. And I'm going to read most of what's found in this passage of Luke 14. So go ahead and turn there. It's found in a different chapter because it's recording some of Jesus' teachings on a different occasion. Like I said, this, this isn't just something that Jesus talked about one time. This is something that was a theme in Jesus' teaching. It came up many times. And, and one of the times that he, he pursued the thought a little further than some of the other places was in Luke chapter 14. So it'd be good for us to look at this. It starts off this way in verse 25. It says, now great crowds were traveling with him. Now let's just pause on that thought for a moment. Great crowds were traveling with him. There was a time in Jesus' ministry where uh, we referred to them as being the days of his popularity. That he had lots of people. There were occasions when he went into a house and there were so many people that flooded that house that it became jam-packed and people were leaning in the windows in hopes of catching a glimpse or hearing a word of what he was saying. They were standing outside the doorway and, and that's, that's how, how packed it was because of the number of people. There were times entire hillsides were covered with the people that were, were pursuing Jesus and listening to what it is that he had to say and usually we think of large crowds you know from that kind of a standpoint we look at that as being something positive because there is an element of excitement that comes right along with a packed house you know i mean how many of you that have been to arrowhead stadium before how many of you enjoy going to a football game when uh, every other seat is empty compared to when you go and every seat is filled I mean, there, there is just some enthusiasm that just fills a stadium or an arena, you know, when it's a packed house. And so we look at that as being something that probably brought a smile onto Jesus' face. The thing is, though, when you look closely in Scripture, you see that it wasn't about the crowds to Jesus. His focus went beyond just how many people do we have in this group today. His focus went beyond that. He was not in the market for half-hearted, fair-weathered followers. He was looking for fully devoted, committed followers. So let's pick the passage up again with that thought in mind. It says, now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that's a phrase you're going to see popping up time and time again in this passage. He cannot be my disciple if this is the case or if this isn't the case. So here he's saying, if anyone comes to me, wants to be a follower of mine, but does, doesn't hate his mom and dad, his brothers and sisters, and his spouse, and even his own life, he cannot be a follower, a disciple of mine. It's like, ouch. I mean, that's, that's some pretty strong words. Now, I can look back in my life, and I can remember a time when I was six or seven years old, and I hated my parents. And I was justified for hating them because they wouldn't let me do this or do that. And then there was a longer span of time when I was like 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. I hated my sisters. But I don't think that that's what he's talking about here. That's, that's, not, that's not what he's drawing reference to. Now, we have a bit of a hard time as we look at this and we hear these words because Jesus, tumbling off of his lips, are words like, unless you hate your mom or your dad, your brother, your sister, your spouse. And we're just like, wow, man, what a contradiction. 
You know, because there are other places in the Bible where he talks about how this is how you'll be known, by your love for one another. So, I mean, this is completely at odds with another passage or multiple other passages of Scripture. Well, here's the thing. In Jesus' teaching, he talked much in the same way that we do and as everyone does, and that means he included figures of speech. And one of the figures of speech to drive home a point, is called a hyperbole. That is an exaggeration that you make in order to really get people's attention and drive home a point. This is a case in point of a hyperbole. Because you will not see Jesus anywhere else talking about hating, you know, your brothers and sisters, your parents, your spouse, or, you know, yourself, and stuff like that. You won't see that. So, again, hermeneutics here allowing the Bible to shed light on the Bible. Let's look at some of the other teachings of Jesus that might shed some light on this. And we don't really have to look any further than back in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. We come across this passage. Jesus said, Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see, he's talking about a comparative type love here. He's, he's saying, he's saying that, that I am to be your first love. And unless I'm your first love, you cannot be my disciple. He's not literally saying or suggesting that we literally hate someone that we know who is close to us. But rather that in contrast, when you compare the degree of our love for the Lord with our love for any other person... I mean, there's such a huge gap there that, that if you're going to compare it, it could even look like hatred. But, but it's not hatred. It's just that our love is so much more intense for the Lord. He wants to be our first love. And some of you maybe remember that phrase, first love, because it's found elsewhere in the Scripture. For example, in the early chapters of Revelation, Jesus deliberately rebukes a church and calls the church to repentance because the church has lost its first love. You know, and so th- this is something that is brought up in more than just this particular passage of Scripture. He wants to be our first love. But he continues. Thoughts continue here. Verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There's that phrase again. Cannot be my disciple. Bearing your own cross and following him. Well, we're talking about cross all over again. Now, sometimes people, you know, we use that phrase in various ways. You know, we might talk about, you know, our brother-in-law and how, oh, he gets under our skin and we hate being in the same house as him whenever the family gets together and all this. But I guess that's my cross to bear. You know, we use that phrase in other ways. That's not how Jesus is using it here. Again, he is talking about self-denial. He's talking about dying to self. Unless you're willing to do that. If you're not willing to do that, you can't be my disciple. That's what, that's what Jesus says. So what's he trying to get people to do in this passage, in Luke 9, in Matthew 10, and some other ones as well? What is it that he's trying to get people to do? He's trying to get them to count the cost. Remember now, there's a big crowd of people that are following him, and he seizes the opportunity as they're following him to say, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. If you want to be a follower of mine, then you need to do this. You need to be willing to do that. And if you're not, you cannot be my disciple. He's trying to get people to count the cost, to think it through, before they immediately sign their name on the dotted line. In fact, that's, we see that clearly here as you read the next few verses. Look at verse 28. It says, For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to make fun of him, saying, This man started to build and wasn't able to finish. See, he's talking about counting the cost. It's like if you were going to build on a, another garage stall onto your house as soon as the notion come across your mind you wouldn't grab a shovel and go out and start digging uh, in the yard and start boarding up a frame for people to come and pour a concrete slab and 
And I mean, you just wouldn't immediately do that. You would sit down and you would do some calculating. You would do some figuring. Do I have what it takes to see this through to completion? That's what counting the cost is. And Jesus is saying, you need to do that same thing with me. Another illustration he gives there in the next three verses uh, regards two kings that are going at war against one another. And he says they'll do the same thing. One king will stop and think about his military compared to his opponent. Is he really going to be able to oppose him? And if he thinks, whoa, we have no chance against this guy, then what he's going to do is he's going to send a delegation to him while he's still far off in order to ask for terms of peace. You see, again, it's the whole idea of counting the cost. And that's what Jesus is trying to get us to do. So look at verse 33. He says, In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not say goodbye to all his possessions cannot be my disciple. There's the phrase again. Cannot be my disciple. Every one of you who does not say goodbye to all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't think that's necessarily meaning that we have got to part with absolutely everything that is in our possession. I don't believe that Jesus is saying that we, in order to become a Christian, we've got to become destitute. Because as you, again, read in other scriptures and allow it to shed light, you begin seeing things like Mary and Martha, who no one would doubt that they were disciples, followers of Jesus, Mary and Martha owned their own home. And they hosted Jesus and his followers on multiple occasions. And Jesus never chastised them. Oh, you own this home? Bad. That's bad. He never did that with them. Zacchaeus, you know, though he came from a, you know, a background that uh, was a bit less than desirable as a tax collector and part of how he made his money as a tax collector, yet... At the time of his conversion, he became a very generous man. And Zacchaeus was giving back money to people that he had wronged. And, and in, in cases, multiple times the amount of money that he had wronged them, he was giving them. But yet, when it all shook out, Zacchaeus was still a wealthy man. And Jesus never chastised him and said, you still got to repent because you own stuff. Yeah, I think for us to take verse 33 and to draw the conclusion that it means that we've got to become destitute and we've got to get rid of everything except for maybe the clothes on our back, I think is going to be taking it a bit further than what Jesus intended for it to be taken. I don't think it means that, but I do think it means that we are to hold our possessions loosely in our hands. Not in a white-knuckled sort of a way, but rather we are to hold our possessions loosely. And if the occasion arises, the situation surfaces, it won't be hard for us to rise to the occasion with generosity. Because ultimately we recognize, and we'll talk about this on an upcoming Sunday, ultimately we recognize that we do not own, we temporarily possess what God owns. And that kind of a mindset, you know, means that it's not our shot to call on this. It's his. And like I said, we'll talk more about that here in a couple of weeks. But I think that that's the point that Jesus is getting at. Now, this whole, this whole concept, Matthew 10, 39, where it says, He who saves his life, clings to his life, will lose it, and he who loses it for his sake will find it, and and uh, this whole passage idea about denying yourself and, and uh, carrying your cross. All of this, I think, is illustrated in a couple of parables. Jesus did a lot of his teaching in parables. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I'll, I've done a sermon series on the parables of Jesus. And sometimes there will be a small group that's focused on the parables of Jesus and and what you may not realize is that the two smallest parables of all account for a grand total of only three verses in Scripture. They are very brief, very short parables. And I think these parables, this is what they're talking about, is this whole concept that we're dealing with here today. They're found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 
44 through 46, here's what Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. That's one verse, that's one parable. Here's the second one. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Two parables, only a grand total of three verses. Now, these sound a bit strange to us, at least parts of them do, like the idea of finding treasure buried in the ground. It's like, who buries treasure in the ground? I mean, if you've got something that's valuable, what would you do with that if you wanted it you know, to be in safekeeping? You would get a safe deposit box, you'd find a bank or something like that. You'd buy a safe and put it in your, in your house, and, and you would do something like that if you had a valuable. But back in that day and time, even though there were banks, common people didn't use the banks. They couldn't afford to use the banks. It was just the wealthy who did. And even with that being said, those banks weren't really that secure, ultimately. And so what the common people did probably was the safest way to approach it is that they would take their valuables, whether it comes in the form of jewelry or money or whatever, they would take their valuables and they would go and actually literally find a place to bury it in the ground. Or maybe a cave that people weren't aware of or something, and they would, they would hide it there. You see, the Bible lands during Bible days was known for frequent warfare. There, there was just battles happening all the time and invading forces. And in the Old Testament, it was just one, one, one city basically against another city. In, in the New Testament, you know, it was, it was people from outside that, that, would, that would known to come in, you know, the Romans and, and their rule and all of this. And, and, and what would happen is that when people would catch wind, of an invading force that was coming that way is they would take their valuables and they'd go out and they would hide it somewhere so that when they rifled through their stuff in their house, they wouldn't find it. That way they'd be able to keep it. However, here was the problem. When an invading force came, what if they took your life and you died? Or what if they deported you into captivity, which you, we read of that happening you know, more than a couple of times in the Old Testament. In cases like that, if you had not told anybody about what you had done and where you had done it at, then your treasure was still buried somewhere, unbeknownst to anyone else. And it could stay there for years. It could actually stay there for decades, and no one would be any the wiser. And then at some future time, you might have a farmer plow in the field, and all of a sudden, boom, they bump into something. They investigate a little further, and they find out, whoa, look what I found in the middle of this field. You see, that wasn't such a far-fetched story in a first-century context. Now, the other parable here is talking about pearls, and just for the record, pearls were viewed much the same way as diamonds are today. They were the most valuable gem in the day back in the first century. Okay, So it helped shed light on that parable as well. Anyway, what's the point of these two parables? The kingdom of heaven is so valuable that one should willingly give up everything to possess it. That's the point that he's driving home in these parables, which is very much consistent with these other passages like Matthew 10, 39 and, and the Luke 9, the Luke 14 passage that we looked at as well. The kingdom of God, having a relationship with our Lord, is so valuable that one should willingly give up everything in order to possess it. Because it matters more than anything. There is no sacrifice that is too great. Now it's interesting that the one difference between these two parables, the one primary difference is that the men who found the treasures their entire approach was different. One guy just stumbled upon the treasure. I mean, he just happened upon it. Like I was saying, maybe he was a farmer and he was plowing in his field or something or other, and he wasn't out looking for treasure. He was just kind of minding his own business and doing his thing, and then boom, voila, whoa, valuable treasure. And from that moment on, it's a celebration, and he does everything he can to acquire that field. The other 
parable is about a merchant. And he is, on the other hand, deliberately searching for that gem, that priceless pearl. And when he eventually finds it, from that moment on, it's a celebration. He does everything he can to acquire it. So from the moment that they, they spot the treasure, the story is the same. But before that, their story couldn't be in further contrast, one from the, the other. And, and I say all that just to say this, that today, in this room, we have both stories represented among the people that are in here. Some of you came to a point in time in your life in making a decision for Christ. You came to that point because you were diligently searching for truth. You felt empty. You felt that void in your life. And you were looking for something of meaning. You were looking for something that, that, that could bring you uh, the, the fulfillment that was seemingly eluding you your whole life. And so you were diligently searching for truth, whether it was watching other people's lives, asking people's questions, doing reading, all this, you know, praying, all this kind of stuff. You're just looking. You're just looking for truth. And then you discovered the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And without hesitation, man, you went for it. You embraced it. And the rest, as they say, is history. You became a Christian, a follower of Christ. Now, on the other hand, there are others in this room that that wasn't really the way the story began with you. You weren't out searching for truth, for fulfillment, or anything like that. You were just kind of minding your own business, doing your own thing, and you just stumbled into it. You know, I told you my story last Sunday about uh, the first time that I spent any time at all reading in the Bible and, and how it was that summer that I made that decision for Christ, the, the one thing that I didn't tell you uh, last Sunday, I've mentioned this in past years, so some of you have heard this, but the one thing I didn't mention last week is that earlier that year, there was a key event that took place in my life that definitely plays into what transpired You know, by the time July rolled around in 1978. And what that event was is that Colette and her family, they were headed... Uh, to uh, a big family get-together, you know, at her grandparents' house. And it was a holiday weekend, and uh, so they, they were all planning on going, and there'd be plenty of food and games and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, you know, and so she asked me if I'd be interested. You know, we were dating at the time. had been dating a number of months. And, and uh, she asked me if I'd be interested in going. And, First of all, I thought, you know, I've never heard of this exotic place called Barnes, Kansas, you know, but I, it's got to be good, you know, and a little town of about 200, an uh, hour or two north of Manhattan. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I, it didn't take me long to make a decision. I mean, you know, you got a, you got a cute cheerleader asking if you want to go with her family for a holiday weekend somewhere, you're going to say yes. And uh, so I said, yeah, yeah, I wanted to spend more time with her. And so I said, yeah, I'll go. So I threw a few things in a bag and threw it in their trunk. And, and we drove to Barnes, Kansas. And sure enough, there was plenty of food, more than enough food there. And there was a variety of games people would play. And, and uh, the town was small. And so, you know, we'd, during uh, when the older people were taking naps, we'd go take walks in town and stuff like this. And, and uh, um and, and then it rolled around to Sunday morning. Sunday morning. And everybody else was just kind of getting up about the same time they did on Saturday and just, just kind of getting their morning cup of coffee and stuff. But there was one family in the whole mix that got dressed and ready to go to church. And that was Colette's family. Because you know, that was something that they, they were just committed to. This is something they were going to do. It wasn't their home church, but... You know, it was Sunday morning, and they were going to be with God's people worshiping. And so Colette and, and her brother and her folks and all, they, they were getting ready to go to church, and, and uh, you know, and Colette had asked if I wanted to join them, and I was sitting there thinking, man, I have no interest in going to church. I mean, why would I want to waste time on Sunday morning in a church? I mean, really, that's, that's what I'm thinking. But then on the other hand, and I'm always a person that thinks things through sometimes to a fault, um, on the other hand, my choice is, since I don't have a car, my choice is to stay here with all these strange relatives that I don't know. 
And so the decision was made pretty quickly, go with the cheerleader. All right, so I decided I was going to going to go with them so so I got dressed and and we went to church and and I know exactly how many people were there in church that Sunday there were 15 because you know I knew I was going to be bored so I was finding things to occupy my mind and and that included counting heads and and uh, and, and there were 15 not counting her family there were 15 gray-haired people now I'm not saying anything negative about gray-haired people because I've got some friends that have gray hair all right so um, yeah, these lights, they're a little misleading. So. But, uh, but I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm counting. There are 15 people, and they all got gray hair. There's no kids. There's certainly no teenagers. I mean, there's not, even, there's not even a person under 50 years of age in the room outside of Colette's family, you know, and myself. The preacher was a guy in his upper 70s, but he was gone this particular Sunday visiting some relatives, and, and so they had a fill-in preacher that came from Manhattan Christian College, and, and he was a young professor, and he came up there, and he preached a message on the Word of God. That, that, was, that was the sermon, just the Bible, just talking about the Bible and what the Bible represents. Now, I am sure for everybody that was gathered in that room, including Colette's family, I am sure that this was like, well, duh. You know, I mean, man, we've heard this like 47 million times already. But here I am sitting at the end of the pew. Yeah, I always went for the aisle seats too, just like you guys. Sitting at the end of the pew. And this is the very first time I have ever heard anything like this in my life. And I'm just like, really? No. And then you talk a little more, and it's like, wow. You know, and there was all these thoughts and thoughts that I had never even considered, had never gone through my mind, I'd never been exposed to before. Now, I'd like to say that I embraced Christ from that moment on. I never, though. You know, we left from there and, and you know. But there were thoughts, there were seeds planted in my mind, and I couldn't shake them. And later, when I opened the Bible, even though there was bad motives and all that stuff, you know, it fed those thoughts. It watered that seed. And the rest, as they say, is history. But here's the thing. I was not searching for truth. I stumbled upon that. You see, and that's, that's the first parable. That represents me. For others of you, though, maybe it's the second parable. But the point of the matter is, regardless of whether it was something intentional on your part or something accidental, although when we're talking about the providence of God, there's nothing accidental here. But whether, whether it was intentional or, from your perspective, accidental, the point of the matter is, when you were exposed to the gospel message, the good news of Jesus, the, the reality of being able to have a relationship with God, that was a priceless treasure. And the point that Jesus is making is that you should be willing to give up everything, absolutely everything, to possess that. Now, there was some terminology that used to be used back in the late 70s. It was terminology that I remember hearing frequently, at least back in the early days of my Christian walk, and a little bit in the early 80s. But then it just kind of faded out, and you never hear people talking like this anymore. But I'm going to go ahead and use it, because I believe that's what these two parables are all about. It's this phrase. It's biblical to be sold out for Christ. The whole idea of being sold out for Christ. You ever heard that phrase before? Being sold out for Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Odds are you haven't heard it a whole lot recently, but you had heard it in the past, more often at least than you do nowadays. But it is a biblical concept. Not that you'll find it verbatim stated in Scripture, but you see it in the parables of Jesus. I don't know whoever came up with that originally, you know, what inspired them to, to refer to being sold out for Christ and everything, but, but ever since I first came to Christ, I have always anchored that concept to these two parables in Matthew chapter 13. That's what Jesus was talking about, is that we need to be sold out for Christ. None of this halfway, half-hearted, straddling the fence sort of a thing. It's all or nothing. I believe that's what is being taught here. That's what he's looking for from us, that our devotion to him be unrivaled. There's not even a, a close second as far as what we're dedicated and devoted to. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that you or I should put before him. 
All right. Back to where we started. James and John were sitting in their fishing boat. That boat represented their lives. Their futures were pretty much all mapped out for them, as I said earlier. This is who they were, and this is what they were all about. And as far as we know, they were comfortable with that. They didn't have a problem with that. It's what they knew. It's what they were used to. In fact, it is what defined their lives. But then along came Jesus, and he called out to them, Come, follow me. And in response, they climbed out of the boat. And as a result, Jesus gave them a new focus, a new purpose in life, a whole new orientation in life. So now the question is, what about you? Now, if you were with us last Sunday, you know what we talked about there. You know, we're, we're not into just studying history to gain knowledge about history. We are to use it. We are to use the teachings of Scripture. So in view of everything we talked about today, we've got to ask this question. What about you and what about me? You know, our culture tends to define what a Christian looks like. Our culture tells us, oh, that a Christian is someone who prays, at least occasionally, maybe prays before they go to bed at night or prays before a meal, or prays when... A loved one is sick. Yeah, that's what a Christian is. Someone who prays. Our culture tells us that a Christian is someone who has a book. They have their own book called the Bible. Don't get carried away with it now, but you got your own book. That's what our culture tells us. Our culture tells us that Christians are people who are trying to be nice. Good moral people, right? I mean, that's what a Christian It's expected. Christian should be a good moral person. Our culture tells us that a Christian is someone who attends church, at least when they can. I mean, if it's only Christmas and Easter, it's only Christmas and Easter. But, or if it's every Sunday for some, you know, or whatever floats your boat there. But that's one of the things regarding a Christian, is a Christian is someone that's affiliated in some degree or another with church. You see, that's what our culture tells us. But here's the thing. It is not our culture that ultimately establishes and defines what a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. Our culture is not, is not who defines that. It is our Lord who breaks it down and spells it out. That's for Him to do. And based on everything that we've looked at here this morning, it seems pretty clear Jesus had no interest in people approaching all of this as though Christianity was a part of their life, one component of their life. I don't think Jesus would support that notion at all. In fact, let me, let me just state it clearly. I believe, and I believe I can say this, you know, with, in view of the things we've looked at today and then some that we didn't have time to look at. I believe that it would be consistent with Scripture for me to say Jesus does not want Christianity to be a part of your life. I think that statement is as biblical as any statement can be. Jesus does not want Christianity to be a part of your life. He wants it to be your life. And there is a huge difference there. We have this tendency of compartmentalizing our lives. But when it comes to this, uh -uh. he's not interested in a slice of the pie, you know, regarding the pie chart of your life. He's not interested in that. He wants to be your life. He wants to permeate every aspect of your life. He wants to be a relationship with him, he wants that to define your life. There's a verse that I want to close with, and our ushers are going to be getting up at this time and preparing for communion. But there's this verse that isn't a, a statement that comes from Jesus. It's a statement that comes from one of his disciples, uh, Paul. And... And it goes hand in glove 
with the passages we've already looked at. Matthew 10, 39, you know, the statement that says, if you cling to your life, you'll lose it, but if you give up your life for me, you will find it. It goes hand in glove with that statement, the ones in Luke chapter 9, the ones in Luke 14 that we looked at. But in, in a sense, Paul phrases it in a way that helps us put feet on this principle. It helps us to understand a little better where the rubber meets the road in regards to what this looks like in a person's life. Here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. Paul says, He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. Yeah, that's hitting the nail on the head there. He died for us. And that's what we remember during our time of communion. We have two trays, larger and a smaller tray. And, and in those trays are little pieces of bread and there's little cups of juice. And following our Lord's own instruction that what we do during this time is we take these and we eat and we drink. And we do this in memory of Jesus and the fact that he died for us. His sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. Yeah, he died for all. So that those who live should no longer, here it is, should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. You see, here's the thing. As Christians, here's the thing. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's not about us anymore. We gave up all those rights. Jesus said, count the cost. Jesus died on our behalf. He gave that ultimate sacrifice that made it possible for us to experience the cleansing from sin. He gave this to us. And in exchange, we gave him our lives. So the result is, it's not about us anymore. You see, when we wake up on any given day of our life, it doesn't matter if it's a Sunday morning or if it's a Monday morning, we wake up on any day of our life, the questions that flow through our mind is not, how do I want to spend my time today? How do I want to spend my money today? What do I want to do in regards to this? Or what do I want to do in regards to that? That's not the question anymore. Now the question is, how would the Lord have me spend this time? How would the Lord have me spend this money? How would the Lord have me deal with that or deal with this? Because He died for us. And those of us who live, we don't live for ourselves anymore. It's not about us anymore. It's about Him. James and John, what that meant to them... Dropping the nets, stepping out of the boat. And that may be something that God's going to be calling some of you to do. But then again, as you give God your dreams and goals and aspirations in life, God may give you some of those back because they're a part of His plan. But then at the same time, God's got the veto power and He may say, no, I've got an entirely different plan for you. He has the right to do that. He died for us. Our lives now are being lived for Him. He's the one that calls the shots. That's the concept that is found throughout all these passages. We'll flesh it out a little more in the upcoming Sundays. Let's pray. Father, thank You for helping to open our eyes and to see Your Word. And even though we're looking at Your Word and stuff that comes back from almost 2,000 years ago. Yet we see relevance there. And Lord, I pray that we would take it to heart and that we would not just approach this kind of stuff, a relationship with you and Christianity and all this faith and the Bible. We won't approach it as just being a part of our life. Lord, rather instead, might it permeate every aspect of our being. That's the least that we can do in view of what you've done for us. Thank you for coming and for dying for us. Please accept our gift of our lives being lived 
for you in return.